Hello, I want to welcome you to the 26th Wall Street Comes to Washington Healthcare Roundtable. I'm Paul Ginsberg, and I'll moderate the discussion today. The purpose of this event is to give the Washington health policy community insights into market developments that are relevant to policy through the eyes of equity analysts who advise investors about the likely performance of publicly traded healthcare companies. Along with a thorough understanding of healthcare markets and the companies they follow, all of our analysts closely follow public policy because of the implications for the companies they follow. Uh, I wanna, before we get started, I wanna thank Arnold Ventures for supporting this event and recognizing the value of providing a forum for outside of the Beltway perspectives on healthcare. Our format will be a roundtable discussion based on questions that have been shared in advance with the panelists. We'll have two opportunities for audience question and answers. The first at round 245, and the second before we end at uh, 3.30. Uh, you can either send questions via email to events at brookings.edu or via Twitter at hashtag Wall Street Health Policy. We have staff monitoring email and Twitter to make sure that we get as many questions as possible. Also, please note that the analysts cannot answer questions about the outlook for specific companies. A transcript and webcast of the conference will be available through the Brookings website next week. I want to introduce the panelists. We have an excellent panel today. Two panelists, Ricky Goldwasser of Morgan Stanley and George Hill of Deutsche Bank are veterans of previous Wall Street roundtables, while Anne Hines of Mizuho Americas is joining us for the first time. The COVID act pandemic has profoundly disrupted American society and US healthcare. Uh, since January 2020, nearly a million people have died from COVID in the United States. And the evidence is incontrovertible that people of color have disproportionately borne both greater har health harms and economic hardships during the pandemic, highlighting longstanding systemic inequities, especially in healthcare. At the same time, the pandemic has spurred innovation in healthcare delivery, particularly telehealth and remote patient monitoring and other digital applications. So going into the third year of COVID, cautiously optimistic as we move toward a more manageable new normal, what are the big questions learned and what are the impacts likely to be going forward? Now I'm gonna start my questions with, uh, with some on the pandemic. And the first one is, uh, what's been the financial impact on various types of providers and health plans? So could you characterize the current financial standing of key provider and insurer types? And are there any long-term implications? Uh, Ricky, should I jump in first? <laughs> As we joked about before the panel. Uh, first, Paul, I say thank you for having, having us all here and having us all back. I'm going to give a very brief disclaimer, which I think probably applies to Ricky and Ann too, which is that the three of us uh, all do investment research for uh, investment banks. You can assume that the banks that we work for seek to do business with any individual companies that may be mentioned here, uh, though I know I have no individual conflicts to report. And I, I, don't, I can't imagine Ricky or Ann have any individual conflicts to report either, but I won't, I won't, I won't pretend to speak for them. Um, I guess, you know, as, as we go into year three, and we're now rolling from what we hope is pandemic to endemic, the endemic phase of this, uh, I think from our perspective, we're generally watching the insurers uh, and various provider organizations as it relates to both what they've learned and the benefit from COVID. Uh, I, I do feel like this is a, a very wide open topic, which we could talk about for, you know, we could probably spend an hour and a half on this. Uh, I would probably focus on my, my areas of coverage, which are managed care uh, and the drug supply chain, where managed care largely has seen COVID as an opportunity uh, where they've collected revenue in the form of premiums and payments uh, from plan sponsors and other beneficiaries. They've tend to, tended to see at the earlier stages of the pandemic, a lot of volatility and utilization, a lot of volatility in medical costs, and medical costs were volatility to the downside, not necessarily volatility to the upside, uh, where you saw earnings positively surprised and then you started to see the rebound in utilization. 
I think one of the more interesting uh, parts of the channel that we've watched is the pharmacy chains, the Walgreenses and the CVSs and the Rite Aids of the world, uh, where they were getting pretty generous reimbursement for the administration of the vaccines. They had pretty high market shares in administration of the vaccine deliveries. Then you had the in-store testing and the uh, at-home test sales, uh, which are pretty significant economic contributors to those guys over the last 12 to 18 months. Um, and then from a provider perspective, you saw generally whether it's docs offices or physicians or the or what I would call like the various flavors of the retail clinic model uh, saw demand for services fall and then start to rebound. Um, but you know, I think for I think for most of healthcare, we've seen COVID uh, be a positive financial experience at least as of recent. Uh, and I think, you know, a lot of the, the learnings have been around readiness and around supply chain and around the, you know, the ability to deliver care in what is a volatile and uncertain environment. Um, but like, as a, the, the, we, could, we could spend an hour and a half on this topic, but I want to be sure to, we keep moving, give Ricky and Ann time to opine. So, so you know, from, from, from my perspective, and, and Paul, thank you for having us um, with you again. It's always a pleasure to, to have that sort of um, discussion and dialogue. Um, so, you know, from, 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 from our perspective, when we think about um, the financial standing of, of key providers and in insurance, I think that large insurance and large provider groups have weathered the storm. And when I say weather the storm, I think earlier in the pandemic, there was this anticipation that the large insurers are going to see a windfall, right? Because just less um, core um, demand. And uh, over the last couple of years, I think the market have realized, right, that that's not was not the case, right? And there are kind of like a lot of things in, in, in play here. Um, but, um, but overall, right, um, with all the put the, the puts and takes, we think that that 2022 is going to be their 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 easier comparisons for them financially versus 2021. But really, the question is like, what happens with the smaller players, with the regional players, where uh, potential losses sort of impact their profits, impact their cash flow. Um, and if you take if you take that right, and you combine it with with the fact that we're in a really tight capital market right now. We're in tight capital market, which is more difficult for smaller players to raise money. We are in a very tight labor market. And these are all things that we're going to talk about later, which means that the cost of business is increasing. And that's more of a burden for the smaller guys. Um, I think that is, to me, sort of the broader question, right? So being um, well-funded at scale um, is even more important than pre-pandemic. And I think that we have to ask ourselves the question, does this mean that longer term there's actually less competition? Um, and does this mean that we're gonna see more m a in the future? Good Hi. point. Go uh, ahead. Yeah, maybe I'll just add from a provider perspective, especially hospitals, since I cover that sector. I would say the main takeaway at first, there was a lot of uncertainty what would happen, but I think what came through was really the resilience of the American people, because even though there was a big blip in utilization, it really did come back stronger than people expected and faster than people expected. Obviously, it varies between which pair, um, younger people, commercial insured people tended to come back faster than Medicare or Medicaid. Medicaid is still really not back to pre-pandemic levels. Um, but there definitely was a resilience. And I think for me going forward, the biggest question is like to what Ricky said, the cost of business will be increasing. And especially for providers, nursing, and we will address this later, nursing is a big factor. Like it has COVID structurally negatively impacted that industry. Um, and I think it's too early to tell because we still have these COVID waves and dips. But once that settles out, we'll really figure out if it's structural or not. You know, and it's interesting what you said about Medicaid not coming back because there's so many more Medicaid eligibles now. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's really striking. Yeah, I think that sociodemographic graphic got hit hard with COVID. So they're probably less likely to get care at hospitals because they were afraid of COVID. Sure. Thank you. Uh, you know, so presumably what you've all talked about may have implications for consolidation. You know, is this likely to mean that we're gonna see more consolidation or is the, you know, financial stress of the smaller organizations going to be a barrier? And, you know, how will the, uh, you know, the more vigorous, uh, you know, promises of antitrust enforcement play, play in here? 
So, so we think that we're definitely going to see more consolidation. And, you know, in our 2022 outlook, that was one of the scenes that we talked about. Um, in, 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 I think that we're going to see um, small scale players sort of um, merging with others to create scale. Uh, we're going to see the larger stakeholders, whether they're healthcare companies or tech companies in some areas or large consumer companies. We see them kind of like looking at healthcare, um, opportunistically um, looking at M&A. I think what would, and, and, and we haven't necessarily seen it yet at scale, um, but I do think that we're going to see more of it um, in the second half of the year, because the thing we're watching for is what's happening with those companies that need to go back and raise money next year, especially given all the volatility. Um, they're just going to be, I think, more pressured to go ahead um, and do something that's strategic. I think it's going to um, depend on their boards, depends, depends on the C-suite. I think they're still kind of like hanging in and hoping that the market is going to return and that, that multiples are going to go up. Uh, but I do think that that is going to catalyze that kind of like um, uh, step up in, in M&A. Yeah, if I can dovetail on that. I think, I think Ricky kind of hit on this very well in the, in the first part of the last question. And now uh, I think we've all, we all probably look pretty closely at the value-based care space and you've seen multiples in that space kind of implode. A lot of the companies that have come public in the last year, whether they came public through the traditional method or through the SPAC method, which is a word we don't hear a lot, you know, SPAC's a four letter word now. Um, but like the, you know, these are companies that are now trading below their last private round in some cases. So mm -hmm. even the private investors are underwater. Um, it's amazing how what's old is new again. I almost call this like WeWork 2.0, where these were companies that used to be rewarded for growth in their KPIs and their stock price, whether the growth was, you know, membership, premiums, lives, however it was being characterized. And the goalposts got moved on these companies as the risk profile of the market moved and the risk profile of the market changed. And all of a sudden, um, you know, we, we used to, I say, we used to cover companies that had lofty multiples that were considered expensive stocks on the promise of earnings delivery in 2025 or 2026 that are now I say, well, you know, they, they were, I thought they were expensive stocks before based on the earnings profile in 2026. And now the market has heavily discounted their ability to deliver earnings in out years and the stocks have kind of imploded and valuations have imploded. To Ricky's point, the need for capital is going to force them into making strategic decisions either around raising capital at, at, at unattractive terms or, you know, will they be pushed into the loving arms of the consolidators as opposed to, you know, looking for that next round of capital, um, you know, whether it's the United Health, the Anthems, the the Aetna's, the Humana's that'll be out there with the waiting arms or the large provider organizations, I think it remains to be seen. But, you know, I mean, there, there, the, and what's interesting is there are so many factors at play here. There's the changes in the capital markets. There's employment. There's wages. There's interest rates. There's like a, a lot of these a lot of these decisions right now are driven as much by the macro as they're being driven by the micro. Um, no. Yeah. A kick over, a kick over Dan. Yeah, and I, I would agree. And I think it really is sector specific as well. Like for example, I cover the clinical lab sector. And if you talk to some of these smaller labs, if they weren't making, if they weren't doing COVID testing, which is very elevated pricing right now, they might have to close or sell because the cost of their business has increased so much that a lot of these benefits that some healthcare service companies are getting through the public health emergency is probably masking some of really the trouble going on beneath the business. Oh, that's really interesting. Um, I wanna switch now, because it was mentioned, to value-based payments. And my question is, uh, you know, are we seeing just more value-based payment contracting between private insurers and providers uh, uh, than than we've seen before. Uh, maybe I'll start with that. I I think maybe to a degree, but it's going to be slow. Uh, that's just how I view it. Um, I, a lot of the companies are talking about it more as a big strategy, like United Healthcare, some of the managed care companies, especially with their Medicare Advantage population, really trying to shift people into you know, providers they own to, you know, just to save costs and things like that. And again, I'm a believer in it. It's just more a timing. I think it's, I think it's very difficult to change the traditional fee, um, fee, fee for schedule. 
hospital companies, they'll say we have some value-based contracts, but it's really still like 5%. So again, I think it's happening. I just think it's going to happen slower than some people think. Yeah, it seems so. This is a story that if you were here four or five years ago, you might have said that as well. And I just yeah. want to point out that, uh, you know, change has really been very slow. And, you know, unless one or the other panelists thinks it sees something happening more rapidly, uh, maybe that's the takeaway. Well, I guess I would put just a slightly different spin on it. I wouldn't say that I necessarily see it differently from Anne. I think Anne is very, very right on what you're seeing on the hospital side. I think on the outpatient side and on the ambulatory side, you're seeing things move much faster. We've seen a tremendous amount of capital formation in that segment over the, of the market over the last two to three years. Um, this is where, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd hop on my soapbox for all the Washington people on the line and be like, you know, I think I said this last year, like, you know, kind of like regulate regulation and rules to some degree drive behavior and your participants in the market are going to look at rules and change behavior to solve for outcome. So I always focus on are your is is your are your policy decisions well aligned with what you want to see? And the example I would use here is we see all these subcap arrangements in the primary care space where you see managed care companies essentially shifting the risk from managing parts of the patient population away from the Medicare Advantage entity and into primary care entities that are then managing patient populations. And they're effectively taking the risk for these patient populations in what would seem to be a more lightly regulated environment from, from a care delivery perspective and from a cost management perspective. Um, so you are seeing lots, you're seeing tremendous growth in the number of participants in this space. You're seeing tremendous growth in the number of lives that are kind of captured under these arrangements, kind of to Anne's point, it's still a very small percentage of the total pie, but you're putting up 25, 35, 45% year over year growth rates projected to grow at that rate for the next handful of years. Uh, I think kind of piggybacking on what Ann said, the hospital organizations, given the consolidation in the hospital market tends to look different than the consolidation in the primary care market. So you've got different competitive dynamics. Uh, so they're not, they're, to Ann's point, they're not incentivized to move off the fee schedule. They're not incentivized to kind of take risks because they're getting paid well under the fee schedule. Um, but I, I, I would just caveat, we're seeing, we're kind of seeing different degrees of movement in different parts of the market. I'll kick it to Ricky. So, so, so I would say a few things. So first of all, we need to think about what the end market is, right? Because value-based clearly is, is a good solution, right? Ultimately for Medicare Advantage. And we're seeing more uh, full risk, right? Value-based in that market. Uh, not necessarily, right? At least for now, um, the right solution for commercial. Um, and we even when we think about sort of what type of arrangement we see, right? We see more full risk on, on the Medicare Advantage side because uh, there are incentives there to, to George's point. Uh, we see, you know, participating in an upside arrangement uh, on the commercial. So I think when we think about the market opportunity and the addressable market, we really have to think about it by end market. And that's, and that's part of it. Um, but more than that, when we think about what the limiting factor, to me, value base is kind of like similar to how people always talk about what are the big trends, right? Demographics are the big trends. Um, value base is one of them. But uh, providers, hospitals, health systems don't have the tools to take on risk. So I think that when you kind of like, what is it? It's kind of like you, um, you, you tie the, the horse to the carriage. We need to make sure that there are tools that can help providers and health system take risk and allow for it, right? And there's connectivity between all of them uh, before we really get that, to that massive shift. And I know that later we're gonna talk about um, digital and healthcare technology, but to me, that is kind of like where we have to think about what is happening in the space right now, because that is sort of the, the, the foundation for later on kind of like um, acceleration and kind of like these value-based payment models. Yeah. And, well, if I could have one more point, Ricky makes a great point about healthcare in this country is not one market. Healthcare is thousands of markets based upon which region you're in, which competitive environment you're in, what your payer structure looks like, what your risk arrangement is. I mean, right, your 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 big divisions are going to be geographic, and then Medicare, Med Medicaid, and commercial. And like again, you you basically multiply the three by the regions you come up with you know, hundreds, if not thousands of healthcare markets. 
in the United States. So the idea that like, you know, why can't we fix the healthcare system or why is the healthcare system broken? It's like, well, which, which healthcare system are you participating in? Which, you know, which healthcare product are you participating in? Yeah. Good. Yeah, I'd like to move us to telehealth now. And uh, just to open this, you know, my sense of, uh, you know, we all know that uh, we will clearly have, you know, tele more, much more telehealth after the pandemic or during the pandemic than we did beforehand. And it seems as though the federal policy for Medicare uh, is, you know, is reflected in the latest appropriations uh, omnibus is, is kind of moving cautiously, uh, following the advice that MedPAC has been making to Congress of, uh, you know, doing more analysis and uh, rather than locking the program in for a long time to, you know, kind of unlimited telehealth, uh, really looking at, uh, you know, what types of services actually, uh, you know, have a positive impact and which parts are problematic. What, what's your sense of what the private insurers are doing as far as their coverage of telehealth going forward? Hey, Ricky, I'll let you kick this one first. Um, sure. So, so I mean, when we think about what the private insurance are doing, I mean, I mean, overall, clearly, in the last two and a half years, we've we've seen that um, telehealth insurance parity, um, and. I, I think for over a year now, that question has been a very relevant question in terms of uh, when are insurance going to scale back and, and is a telehealth visit truly an equivalent for an in-person? Um, I think that, and, 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 and you know, each payer that we speak with has different philosophy, right? There's some that, that want to scale back very quickly and others that have different approaches. But to me, I always kind of like think about, let's follow the workflows of what is actually happening in the marketplace. And today, when, you know, one area where we're being told that, that telehealth uh, makes a lot of sense, right? Pre-op, post-op, kind of like full-op services. Um, today, when I go to a physician um, and I pay that physician, if it's a fee-for-service model, the payment is for the procedure, right? For the operation. I actually don't pay for that first appointment and I don't pay for the full-op appointment. So to me, you know, here is an example where telehealth is an add-on. It makes it easier, but but you shouldn't really be paying for it, right? Because we wouldn't pay for it um, in kind of like a, an in-person environment end-to-end. -end. Um, so I do think that insurance have to be and will be very thoughtful on where parity matters and where it does not. So for example, behavioral health, there's clearly very, very acute issue of, of supply and demand. Um, and it lends itself very well for telehealth. So that is where you're gonna see parity. Um, so even if we see headlines that say that uh, maybe reimbursement is lower, we have to kind of like really peel that onion because uh, sometimes it makes sense and sometimes it's not different than how things have been done in the past. And, and just to add, I actually think physicians will have a say, I do a corollary survey of, of about 250 physicians. And when I ask that question, depending on the physician specialty, I get very different answers where some will say it depends on the reimbursement because obviously the reimbursement is elevated um, via the public health emergency. Some say I prefer to see the patients in person. It's not the same. So I think they'll have a, a big say on what, how they want to practice medicine because ultimately the physician is the one's practicing the medicine. So it makes sense for some like behavioral, definitely, especially in rural areas. So, I, and I also think geography will play a part in this as well, because in some rural areas, there's a severe physician shortage. So, um, but I think physicians will, their voice will matter as well. Yeah, I, I, I think the only thing I would dovetail on here is again, depending upon where you sit, it's like, even as a payer organization, are you seeing telemedicine either as a revenue opportunity or a cost center? Yeah. Um, and if you, right, if you own your own telemedicine capability, again, we kind of come back to this fragmented delivery system. If you're an ASO provider of services and you have an integrated telemedicine model and you can charge for it, you're going to steer patients in that direction. And if you're a risk bearing provider, you're going to see it as something that hits your cost of goods sold. And you're basically want to, you're going to want to contain costs against your medical costs and you might, you might discourage it. Um, we are starting to see a little bit, there's been rumblings inside the federal government, Paul, I think you alluded to this, like, Will the federal government in Medicare fee for service pull back the easy access to telemedicine that's been granted during the pandemic? We are seeing some of those initiatives at the state level 
worrying about true, you know, in, in uh, Medicaid populations, has access to telemedicine uh, kind of been too readily available? And then I, I know Ian talked about behavior and re behavioral, and I will probably hop into this. It, it does become very disease state specific. Um, and I'd say, you know, in general, like in low weight and what I would call like regular way acuity care, like going to a telemedicine doctor as opposed to going to the ER or the primary care space, we're starting to see utilization there come down, not quite approaching pre-pandemic levels, but normalizing at a number under 10% of total visits. Yeah. Let me ask about payments. Uh, you know, I guess, uh, you know, what we don't know is when the public health emergency is, is ended, uh, you know, will the parity between payment for telehealth and, uh, uh, and bricks and mortar care, uh, you know, be, be over? Will telehealth be paid less? Uh, and, you know, are, are the private insurers thinking that, you know, they might follow whatever Medicare does, or do they have their own ideas as to how they're planning to proceed? Uh, I, I guess I'll hop in first on this one and I'll go. Again, I think it depends on, um, it kind of depends on where you where like where you fit in the on the food chain and if you if if telemedicine is a cost center for you you are going to try to pay less you think about the health plans that are trying to start virtual first care offerings or virtual first delivery models uh, as it relates to benefit design right they're they're right they're starting with virtual first because they're expecting it's going to be the easiest to access and the lowest cost uh, and then you'll 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 work I'd say just like in benefit design in almost any other category, you're going to want to work through your lowest cost care delivery options before you work into your higher cost care delivery options. Um, and, and then if you're, if, if you're a revenue generator, if you're using telemedicine as a revenue generator, you're going to try to preserve reimbursement around it. I, th I think over the long term, it's hard to imagine that telemedicine reimbursement is going to remain at parity to, to yeah. reimbursement. I agree. I think it's, it obviously depends, but I think, it's unlikely it stays. It's, it's, you know, again, it's interesting just going back to, I think that um, it will require study and analysis yeah. to take time because, you know, it's, th there are areas where I think about it, you go to a physician visit to in office, there's a lot of code stacking that's happening, right? That means that the total cost of that visit might be meaningfully higher than the telehealth visit, despite the fact that, that you have kind of like reimbursement parity. So I do think that, that um, from the private insurer side, there's gonna be a lot of sort of analysis um, until we get to kind of like the, the true answer. But I would say that, and it's, it's, it's again, if we think about this holistically, what is telehealth? And if we think about telehealth, just like we think about in person, right? It's just it's 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 it's, it's just another medium of providing care. Is it really that you, it should be reimbursed? Is should it be a telehealth code, or should the reimbursement be more around what is that particular service? How does this particular service apply to sort of that other services um, that a patient is getting? Okay. Uh, any thoughts about how? you know, integration between virtual only telehealth providers and bricks and mortar, you know, providers that, uh, you know, people see in person uh, some of the time. Uh, is that going to be a source of real fragmentation or are they finding ways to share information, et cetera? I mean, I, I, I can take it. So first of all, I think that the digital first, which you kind of like, I think referring to, because you're referring to digital first and sort of that integration between digital and in person. Um, digital first are basically narrow networks, right? I mean, um, you you really, you control the environment, you control the leakage. Uh, you can very easily refer to sort of kind of like that, that, that a specialist. So I do think that digital first actually is going to encourage, it, it is an integrated in approach it will mean that there's just kind of like more collaboration, more cooperation between. And I think that that's something that's gonna, it's here to stay and it's gonna be in, have an increasingly more important role. It's sort of step therapy also in a sense. Right? We talk a lot about step therapy on the drug side, that this is what this is. But that, that, that's how I was thinking about it when I, when I talked about it as part of the benefits act, because I was thinking about it as a, as a step editor or prior author, however you wanted to, however you wanted to think about that process. 
Oh, thanks. Yeah, that's good. Uh, let's turn to mental health care. And, uh, you know, we know that the pandemic has, uh, you know, really increased the, the need for mental health care. And, uh, you know, we're, but there are a lot of shortages in both inpatient capacity and, and for mental health clinicians. So, uh, you know, how are the payers likely to handle this imbalance? Uh, you know, they, they perceive the need for more mental health services. The services are short supply. And let me ask one other thing is that, uh, you know, as uh, the ability to get mental health services uh, through telehealth uh, makes it more attractive I think for many patients, and thus they'll want to demand more. Uh, but is this going to even exacerbate the shortages? And you know, we start wondering about well, who's going to get those services, <clears throat> or on the other hand, are providers able to actually deliver more uh, since they can do it from home? Uh, maybe I can start with this one. I think this is actually a very interesting topic because the Washington environment there's just no consensus among obviously Democrats and Republicans. And there's so much consensus around increasing mental health parity. And I actually think there might be a standalone bill. If one bill gets through Congress this year, it could be a standalone mental health parity bill that really addresses the mental health parity law in 2007, because there's a lot of the view in Washington among um, Congress is that health insurance is not following that law. So I actually think that congressional action will force almost insurance companies to cover benefits, but cover benefits um, more. Because mental health, it's especially when you get to the inpatient side, it's very managed by every payer besides Medicare. Commercial is overly managed, managed Medicaid is overly managed. Um, and it's an area that the government's looking at. And, and because of the shortage on both the nursing side and the physician side, I think telehealth has to be, play a big part of any type of legislation that goes to Congress. And it, and it probably will include um, some increased telehealth benefits once that bill goes through. But I, I actually think that increased coverage will be dictated by Congress. I, I would take a little bit of a big picture approach to this. And Anne, I'd be interested if you have like, I don't know the numbers off the top of my head for the inpatient mental health component, but we've looked closely at the outpatient mental health component. Yeah. And what I would say is that like, again, from a, so I, like, I completely agree with Anne where things are going on mental health parity, but what we see from a big picture perspective is that if you look at the, the healthcare dollar writ large, where, where dollars go in big slices, hospital payments, outpatient payments, labs, drugs, stuff like that, Mental health is not a big slice of the dollar. It's a very, very small slice of the dollar. So there is lots of room for mental health to grow inside of the health dollar, I'd say without changing the size of the pie, so to speak. So I think that we can kind yeah. of achieve the goals that Anne is talking to around parity and not necessarily moving the needle on, on how much on what the macro healthcare costs are. And the good news, right, is you, right, you can increase access through telemedicine while you mix down on price per visit at the same time. Um, so I think, you know, well, you know, I'm a, like, I like to make like, like, we're all going nuts two and a half years into the mental health, into the COVID crisis here. We probably all need a therapist. Uh, and, you know, the, 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 health, the healthcare dollar writ large says there's money in the budget for each of us to see one. Um, so I, again, I think, I, 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 don't, I don't think acts, I mean, I think the, the, the labor shortage in mental health care is the, is the issue. I don't know that cost and its place in the budget is the issue from, from the work that we've done. Yeah, well, let me push further about this labor shortage. <clears throat> about, you know, how, is, won't that be a big constraint and, and what might be done longer term to alleviate that? So, um, and I think that that's something that we talked about um, a couple of years ago when we did, uh, when we had this discussion at, at the very early days of COVID. Um, and that is, you know, practicing uh, medicine right across states uh, was allowed for a brief period of time, then was pulled out. Um, if you think about mental health, here's such a way, right, where you bring technology in, in sort of telehealth services, and you can solve for this um, supply um, demand um, issues that we're seeing. Um, training therapists across states, right? You have someone in California, 
that uh, is three hours behind, they can work with people on the East Coast. There are easy solutions um, that require tweaks, and that's where I see the, the opportunity. It's opportunity that's going to come out of need. Yeah. Ricky said it, using technology to better utilize capacity. Yeah. Great. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Um, as far as the other digital technologies, as far as... Uh, you know, monitoring chronic conditions, hospital at home. Uh, are either of those going to be more significant going forward? I, I mean, I can lead it on every, every payer organization trying to drive every inpatient care delivery opportunity that they see into a lower cost of care setting, ideally into the home, has been... I mean, I, that's a trend that's been going on for the, for, I'd say for at least 20 years now, I guess. The, right? And, and, we're, and where we're getting to now is just what level of acuity can you drive out of the inpatient setting and into the home just becomes the question. Um, I feel like this is kind of Anne's bailiwick because she's the hospital analyst and I'm not the hospital's analyst. Uh, but but like, like, like I, I, know, I know coming at it from the payer angle that that's the, what everybody wants to do. We could, you know, we could talk yeah. about United Healthcare announced another $4 billion acquisition the other week of a home care company. Uh, again, just building the capacity now to be in a position to provide care delivery in the home for people. Well, you know, yeah, and and how are the hospitals thinking about this? I mean, the hospital's goal is actually to get the patient out of the hospital because I don't know if you've been in a hospital lately, but the patients there are very sick. I need to be in a hospital and their goal is to get the patient out in the, into a good setting. And sometimes it's the availability of a good setting. Like inpatient rehab, for example, and you have to look at capacity utilization um, is a very high capacity utilization. So there's not enough supply for the demand, but home is very important. And it's ultimately where the patient wants to be, is where the family wants the patient to be, but they need the patient to come back um, not too soon because hospitals do not want the patient to be readmitted. Like that's a big thing for the government readmission rates. So um, I think payers, um, hospitals, you saw HCA actually invest in its first home health business, a small regional one. Everyone's trying to increase their access to some type of home health or a, whether it's digital, digital um, some type of capability because that is where the care is shifting if the acuity of the patient allows it. And again, with the aging of the population, I always joke that I've been in this business for 25 years and people were talking about the baby boomers 25 years ago, but they're actually here now. And we will have a, and people turning 72, um, a growing five to 6%. So um, that is gonna be a big focus for, I would say every single part of the healthcare system, whether it's provider payer, Okay, great. This may be a good time for, to turn to questions from the audience. Uh, and I've got some here. Uh, one is circling back to an earlier analyst comment. Can you please explain why value-based care is not a solution for the commercial healthcare market? Uh, can, I, can I hop in on this just because I did a call on this this week with a benefits consultant? Right. Okay. And it just kind of cracked me up where the, 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 the benefits consultant at one of the large benefits consulting firms is working with one of his self-insured employer clients. And like, it's kind of the, it's the, uh, like, it's like the, the, you know, the self-insured employer sponsor wants the provider to take more risk and put more skin in the game, but they don't want to buy a risk and they don't want to pay a premium to the insurance company. I, I, I guess I just, I feel like there's, Simplistically speaking, when you ask someone to take risk, you are asking them to commit some type of capital, which they then charge you a premium for, which nobody seems to want to buy or pay for. So why are we not seeing more initiative on you know, kind of commercial plans moving towards risk, right? The, hosp the hospitals that Ann covers are getting paid very well right now without taking risk. And these self-insured yeah. employer sponsors think that they're paying very low benefits costs without paying risk. And the insurance companies are being paid nicely to sit in the middle for, from an ASO perspective and ad adjudicate claims and you know leverage their network contracts and le leverage their discounts and leverage their rebates while not taking any risk. So everybody feels like they're doing great right now without taking for a bunch of risk and without paying for a bunch of risk. But everybody else wants, 
everybody wants somebody else to put more risk in the game without paying for it. So we kind of, you know, we're stuck with this circle of people who want, you know, you know, Paul, I want you to take all the risk for this presentation going well, you know, without me, you know, without me preparing for it. Like, so it's kind of, you know, it's, it, the, you, you kind of, you kind of walk into this, every, everybody's got to kick in their, their share for, for value-based care to take off in the commercial space. Yeah, that, that's a really interesting insight. I'm glad you brought that forward. Uh, can I add one point to that? I would sure. say also in the commercial market, we're in a very tight labor market. And when it comes to those value-based arrangements, you would have narrower networks. Um, employees wouldn't have as much access as they probably would want. And health insurance is very important um, to offer employees. So I think the tight labor market is probably impacting that as well from an employer desire to do it. Yeah, and, and, and I would say one other thing when you think about commercial, we have to think about the population, how sick the population is, right? Value-based work yeah. when, you are, when you are treating individuals that, that are sick, right? That have chronic diseases, Medicare population, Medicare Advantage, right? People over the age of 65. Um, that is sort of the, 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 the near-term, right? Market opportunity. Um, you talk with MA markets and they said, even with that population, right? It's, it's basically 20% of the members. It's about stratifying and identifying 20% of the members that account for 80% of the medical costs and managing them under value-based arrangement. On the commercial side, you just have less of that. So I think the dollar opportunity is smaller and that's why in the totem pole, we're so early in penetration, they're just kind of like markets that present a bigger opportunity. And Ricky, you make such a great part on Medicare Advantage because when you look at Medicare Advantage versus almost every other market, like because of Medicare Advantage, through the regulatory process of the government, you have this broadly developed risk framework that does not exist in any other market, speak so to speak. So like like the, the framework for how risk gets attributed and paid for exists in MA in a way that it doesn't exist in other places. And, and, and Paul, I like to drop in one of my euphemisms here is that, you know, you have to remember that we're only solving for three things. We're, we're solving for, you know, high quality of care, low cost and broad access. I tell people you get to pick two. And the third one is kind of something that falls out of picking which two you choose to prioritize. Yeah, good. I've got a question here that uh, uh, came in before we started, uh, but it looks really good to me. Why is Wall Street convinced that startups can manage primary care and save money? Are they right? Oh, man. Oh, man. So, so I think that, that it's an interesting question, right? Because if you think about um, what are those startups, right? They're just kind of like they are, we're, we're seeing um, a lot of kind of a capital investment formation in order to develop sort of new models that can help, right, solutions to close gap in care. And that is what these startups are, are, are about. So, so to me, it's less about um, or can they ultimately, um, be, I mean, some of them might ultimately become bigger organizations. Some of them might be part of um, already larger organization. But it's, it's about innovation. It's about where those startups, you know, George talked about taking risk, right? Those startups can take on risk uh, in, all, in order to help solve these gaps in care. And, and that's a purpose, just like in tech world, where right? we're seeing um, tech startups um, taking risk and coming with innovating products. Um, that's what we're seeing in healthcare. Yes, yeah, so I guess a lot comes down to, you know, Will they be effective at changing how primary care physicians behave? Or is it just a matter of providing primary care physicians with the right supports? Uh, and this will cause them to behave very differently. I mean, I, I, think, I think you need to experiment at the margins. Like you need to test and experiment at the margins. And one of the interesting things um, about primary care, and I'd say about healthcare delivery in general in this country from the provider perspective is there's kind of no uniform handbook around that either. It's like I'm here in Cambridge, Massachusetts and the, the doctor coming out of Harvard Medical School right now learned how to practice medicine from the doctor who trained him, who learned from the doctor who trained him, which might be slightly different from the doctor who's coming out of uh, NYU close to where Ricky is or like, like so that like there's there are variances in care delivery that result from how doctors were trained and how medicine is delivered in regions. 
and I'd say you should you should think about it like again I come back to I come back to like this fragmentation of the healthcare system like we have these these variances and, and nuances that exist everywhere um, but I think what's important is that you continue to test and experiment around the margin so you know these startups like they're going to try new models new incentives new procedures um, to try to create some new opportunities and some savings here. And, and I would say, you know, the, 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 the dirty secret of healthcare, right? Healthcare, I mean, we always talk about healthcare innovation, but not a very innovative industry, right? And, and it's because it, it's a very regulated industry. Um, it takes years to make changes. You need these type of innovators uh, to drive the industry forward. Good. Thank you. This is probably a good time to uh, wrap up our questions and take a break and then come back on other topics. I apologize. Someone reminded me that we don't take breaks. Uh, if anyone needs a break, uh, they can step away. But uh, why don't All we right. continue the, uh, the conversation? And uh, I apologize to the audience uh, watching as well as the uh, analysts. Uh, so next, I'd like to talk about workforce issues. And, uh, you know, workforce shortages, especially for nurses and hospitals, obviously everyone's concerned about that. And uh, maybe you could start, Anne, about, you know, what are nurses, I mean, what are hospitals plans going forward to address the, the nursing shortage they're experiencing now and expect to continue, I gather? Sure. I think hospitals hope that some of it naturally ease because what's happening during COVID is obviously we've had very elevated COVID hospitalizations and they've had to recruit other nurses. So they had to use a lot of temporary per diem nurses when they had elevated COVID cases. They had to do a lot of travel nurses, which are 13 week contracts on much higher pay. So now that hospitalizations are decreasing, they do hope there's just some ease in that nursing cost going forward. But there probably is some structural change. It's similar to teachers. There's like this great retirement of teachers because the average age of a teacher in the US, I believe is over 50, and that is similar to the US. So um, there are nurses retiring, but I don't think it's 20% of nurses, but it's enough that causes some of the hospital companies that I covered to to um, be concerned. And I think what they're doing initially this year is realizing and appreciating that these nurses are burnt out. So they'll probably get more bonuses, more vacation, maybe less hours per week when the COVID demand ends and really doing what they usually don't do um, and giving them a lot of love and tenderness, like things that they need to recoup and resolve the burnout. I know that sounds silly, but that's what they're doing. But going forward, um, in a hospital situation, and it, it depends on the state, you might have staff regulations or there's industry accepted nurse staffing ratios. It will be an issue if there is some type of structural shift going forward. So I think permanently pay will be increased, um, increased benefits, pay for education. You just really have to want that nurse to work at your hospital. So even though it was always competitive to find a nurse, it will, be, it, it will be more competitive. You know, I know the US government is doing some things to attract nurses from outside the company. So there's some visas happening this summer so they can do some international nurses. But again, um, it is an issue. Um, hopefully it's not gonna be an issue as we fear once, once the whole COVID hospitalization <laughs> fixes itself, I think we'll really see how bad it is. Um, it's probably not as bad as people think, but it will be an elevated pressure point going for, forward. And for hospitals, they can pay more. So I'm actually more concerned about the non-hospital providers, home health, behavioral, for example, because they may a behavioral nurse, nurse might make like $85,000 a year, but hospitals could be paying $120,000 a year. So they might leave a setting and shift to an acute care setting you know, for a hospital, um, it's a margin margin impact, but for home health or behavioral, it's actually a revenue impact and a margin impact. Because if you don't have the nurses, you can't admit patients. So I'm more worried about just the non-hospital assets more than anything. Well, that's interesting. And I guess, you know, the big question, which we can't know the answer to is, uh, you know, a few years out, uh, 
uh, you know, past the pandemic, is uh, is there going to be some structural change in people's willingness to become a nurse? Uh, you know, particularly in a hospital because of what uh, nurses went through during you know the intense COVID time, and uh, you know, I'm sure it'd be a long time before we can answer that question. Yeah. I think it's we, time will tell. So um, I'll, I'll I'll take a different approach to it. I mean, clearly we're seeing there are shortages, and and, and clearly um, there is this fatigue, right, of 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 being in healthcare. Um, but all, we, what we've also seen over the last couple of years, we've seen greater acceptance for uh, a bigger role for nurse practitioners, right? For, for physician assistants, I mean, for pharmacists. Um, so I think that, that it would be actually very interesting to see how the industry evolves because if now you're being empowered and you can do more, and I think there are 23 states where allowed for that, um, does this mean that actually we are making this into a more interesting field and we potentially could see new people kind of like coming into it. So again, it's, it's, it's gonna take time, it's long, but I think that we also need to think about what the role is and how the role is evolving and, and, and is, is gonna change. I'll say, I'm, I'm listening to the question, Paul, my head is in a completely different place thinking about like have all the managed care companies appropriately priced for medical cost inflation for calendar 22 and what am I, you know, what are the numbers gonna look like for calendar 23? Because when we think about the labor shortage, I think we think about healthcare as a, as a generally better educated part of the workforce and a generally more expensive part of the workforce. Um, having said that, you know, with inflation at eight and a half, running at eight and a half percent, almost 9%, people who are not getting wage increases that match that are seeing their purchasing power increase. Historically, you have seen healthcare costs appreciate faster than inflation as opposed to slower than inflation. So at some point, do we have a healthcare cost catch up that we need to be concerned about. Is that a back half of it's probably, and because healthcare tends to run on an annual basis, probably looking like a calendar 23 event as opposed to a calendar 22 event. Um, I, you know, I'm just, I'm, I'm seeing, right. I'm seeing great recession. I'm seeing inflation. I'm seeing ballooning healthcare costs. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm glad you brought that up, particularly because my Brookings colleague, Matt Fiedler has recently published something about, you know, explaining why the healthcare pricing numbers have been increasing so slowly. Uh, and that, uh, you know, that a lot of that is temporary. And, uh, and there's even the possibility of, uh, you know, some, uh, some kind of bounce back uh, as a result of that. Uh, because, you know, so much has been really based on uh, projections, uh, certainly in Medicare. And, uh, you know, the projections, obviously, you know, we're not, were not accurate. And, uh, uh, you know, it could mean that the next projections err on the high side, say. And it's also interesting, right? Because at least from a Wall Street perspective, the investment community was really um, favorably surprised by the MA rate increases that they were so high and there was expectations that low. What are they really based on? They're based on sort of these projections that we're going to see medical spend going up and there is inflation and if you have to raise it not necessarily because you are giving um the ma players just kind of like more dollars it's because these are dollars that have to be used to offset this this increase spend and in and in, in increased cost and inflation yeah and, and i'd say and that's uh, I'm, I'm gonna start the jazz I'll say, but that's I'll, I'll jab at ricky in here and say that's kind of a, a sticky wicket though because from an individual company perspective like we're talking about we're talking about this this creative destructive cycle of new entrants that come to market and industry consolidation that occurs that gets rid of some of the new entrants or gobbles up some of the new entrants and creates stable competitive environments for, for the remaining companies that participate in the environment. Uh, I think while the rate increase is a great thing uh, for the companies that participate in the space, um, as, as somebody looking at individual companies, I question that, you know, we've, we've helped subsidize some of the inflation that we expect, but we've also we're subsidizing marginal competition in the market with these great rate increases. Um, and I like to look at the corollaries through the history of the space where you had just what tends to happen is that in spaces where there's rapid growth or where there's, you know, 
excess, you know, rapid growth in an industry and the, the rapid growth of capital towards an industry creates excess competition, which forces companies to not be lean and disciplined and kind of forces an irrational competitive environment to some degree, which then needs to shake out later. I wonder if we're doing that in the Medicare Advantage space where we're just, you know, these great rate increases are subsidizing marginal competitors who might not be able to survive X and eight and a half or 9% rate increase. Yeah. And uh, actually, just while we're on that topic, uh, you know, do you see, you know, continued entry into the Medicare Advantage space or, or is that, uh, I know some of the recent entrants have, uh, have run into some problems. I mean, we'll wait to see, you know, kind of the, the next, next go around to the number of approved plans, but we continue to see, you know, growth in the number of plans, the number of products in the space. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Uh, let me raise a question about long-term care facilities. And, uh, you know, we know the huge impact of uh, COVID on nursing homes. And, uh, you know, will there be a long-term impact of, you know, institutional long-term care providers playing a smaller role in the system relating to, you know, various uh, uh, things of, of services at home for, for those that uh, need long-term care services? Um, I could take that. I mean, I think longer term, if you're a discharge from a hospital and you need rehabilitation, you can get it in a couple of places. You can get it at a home, which a nursing home might be the person's home, or you could get it at an inpatient rehab facility or home health. It really depends on the acuity, acuity of the patient. Um, I do think after COVID, more people will probably be hesitant going into like a SNF or a nursing home environment to get rehab. So maybe they choose to go into an inpatient rehab um, hospital, which really, if you look at the government data, they have very good statistics, like the readmission rates from an inpatient rehab back into a acute care system is only about around seven to eight percent versus if you get care at a nursing home, it's more like 15 to 18 percent. So that's a big divergence in readmission re um, re rates. So again, I think there will always be the drive to take people out of nursing homes, but some families don't have the option. So, I mean, I think nursing homes will always be around and, but it, I think over the next decade, just this focus on home health and improving things and offering more services in the home setting, which will alleviate the family, you know, the families, what the family has to do to help the patient you'll see more shift um, back to the home. But again, um, I think it's investment into a lot of services, a lot of capability by both providers and the commercial payers for the ability to do that. But I was reading your question, like there was no, none of the hospitals ever talk about one and two own a nursing home or get back into that business. Okay, I'm glad you answered that next yeah. question. Uh, let's talk about the future of independent physician practice. And, uh, you know, we know physicians are leaving independent practices. And uh, uh, what have been the most important destinations? I gather there are three. There's, you know, larger independent groups, private equity ownership, hospital ownership, or insurer ownership. And, uh, uh you know, which type of any perceptions on which types of ownership might, uh, you know, prove to be most uh, viable? I mean, when I look at what type of physicians, private equity or these pr private equity based companies, they tend to focus on emergency room physicians, they tend to focus on anesthesiologists, they tend to focus on um, neo, neo, um, I can't, the, um, maybe neurology a little bit, but I really, I actually think it really depends on the facility. Like for cardiologists, they tend to like to be owned by hospitals. Um, and, and again, when a physician decides to, we want to not be alone anymore, there's also other factors that might determine that whether they are, um, medical malpractice is very high. So like, for example, emergency room doctors, medical malpractice is very high. It's very difficult for them to be independent. Obstetricians was the third one that is a big, um, either hospital owned or um, you know, publicly traded hospital owned. They tend to go into that type 
because of the medical mal malpractice insurance. Um, anesthesiologists, um, there was a big trend over the past, say, five years for them to really go into um, not, not own ownership anymore. A lot of that had to do with the um, reporting data. They just didn't have the money. They would have to. They would have had to invest a lot of dollars into um, technology to report um, data back to the government, and they just didn't have the money. And that that's kind of that really led anesthesiologists giving up ownership of their practices. So again, I really think it depends on the environment, um, the type of physician, things like that. I, I think it, it's also a matter, I mean, at the end of the day, right, private equity is buying those not to own them forever. So uh, ultimately where they're going, right? And I think that uh, it all ties back to where we were before, um, insurer ownership. If you have a large Medicare Advantage book, right, you want to own a provider and you want to own a provider because that's going to create that stickiness with the membership, which is going to be increasingly important um, as the market becomes more competitive and is ultimately growth in MA is going to slow down at some point. Um, same with, with hospitals, right? We talk about kind of like the move from the four walls of the hospitals more into the home. Um, to stay relevant, right? Do you need to own these these groups? Um, so I, I I think that the end game is that that private equity does sell those to to the to health insurance. plan and, yes. and insurance and into into health systems. Uh, oh, good, very good. Uh, you know, with the No Surprises Act uh, having been enacted and implemented, and uh, you know private equity owning the specialties of emergency medicine and anesthesiology that where, uh, you know, surprise billing was so important. Uh, do you think this really undercuts the rationale for private equity to own those specialties or are there enough, enough other reasons like when Ann mentioned the, uh, the malpractice insurance that uh, it, it'll still be uh, a significant thing for private equity? It probably decreases their urge to buy it because that was a big strategy. And not all private actors would do this, but some would. They would acquire these physician practices and specifically make them out of network to get higher reimbursement. I would say that has stopped, though, over the past few years, obviously, because of um, the government's initiatives to stop you know, those type of things. So I, I would say yes, um, to a degree, but I would still continue. I, I don't think it ends it. I just think it probably slows the growth. Okay, yeah. And, and also another reason that, you know, the consolidation was part of a private equity strategy and consolidation won't result in, in increases in, uh, in fees so much because of the, you know, the No Surprise Act. Yeah. And, and also, I think it depends on the specialty, like primary care. That's the hot thing right now. Um, several companies want to get into it. So you might see a big uptick in private equity based companies um, with PCPs and things like that. So I really think it um, depends on the specialist. OK. OK, thanks. Uh, actually, uh, you know, are there important insurers other than United Health Group through its Optum subsidiary and or Umana that are making large investments in physician practices today? So well, Paul, the question, are there other insurers that are kind of pursuing that strategy? Yeah, in a sense, what I was wondering is that, is it that United, is it Optum and Humana are kind of outliers, they're doing their own thing? Uh, but nobody else is doing that, or are, are, are others engaging in significant activity as well to own physician practices? Yeah, so so CVS under Anne's Day in December, or actually a little bit before that in early December, really talked about publicly through a press release about um, their intent to invest in primary care and, and to grow uh, primary care. Um, I would say again, because if we think about it, why United? Because they have 25% uh, MA market share. Why, why Humana? Although I don't think that Humana necessarily is really uh, followed through on an ownership model that they're, they're starting now. I think 
a, a little small and a little late because uh, they have 20% of, of, of MA market, right? And it's 70% of their business. Um, CBS is the third largest MA player. So again, it, 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 we, I go back to, um, let's think about strategic investment they're making and, and, and think how they're tied to what markets um, they're serving. So, so I think that you will see that um, these investments uh, for insurers that serves market where it makes sense to own. So, so do I necessarily think that um, Cigna should own primary care uh, of ownership? No, right? Because they're not in the MA market. But so, so that's it's kind of like it's it's follow the lives. Yeah, that 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 really makes sense to me. Yeah, yeah thanks I, for bringing that I, up. And, and maybe just to dovetail on that, it also goes to like again, we're really talking about all this going on in MA and the focus being on MA because there's. The, there's kind of the, the there's the risk infrastructure there, and there's the ability to kind of shift costs and shift risk around, shift earnings around, um, and in in segments of healthcare where there where that is less obvious or you have a lower degree of capability to do that, it's just less attractive to do. Yeah, yes, yeah, so I could see this also plays into the fact that uh, we're likely to see a very different story for different specialties. You know, we've been talking about the story for primary care. Uh, and I think Ann mentioned that hospitals like to employ cardiologists in particular. And, uh, you know, I could see how this market's sorting out according to the, uh, you know, opportunities for different owners by specialty. Yeah. I would say hospitals really don't like to own doctors. They will do it if they need to <laughs> in specific markets because, once a doctor takes ownership, they tend to work a little less. Um, um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they do it out of need. Good. Uh, okay, let's let's talk about the insurance industry now. Uh, you know, which segments uh, are seen as the most attractive for expansion at this point? Is it Medicare Advantage, uh, Medicaid, individual market, or somewhere else? I mean, I think we'd all agree MA is clearly MA, number one. Yeah. Yeah, MA, like MA is clearly number one. And then I think there, there might be some debate whether the individual market is has increasingly sustainable attractiveness and is poised for growth off a very small base. Um, Medicaid probably from a growth profile number two, except for we're gonna go through this redeterminations period as we exit the public health emergency, it kind of resets the bar there. And then commercial just kind of lumbers along. Is that is that the consensus? Am I, did I yeah, say anything yeah. anybody wants to disagree with? It, no. It's the consensus, and, and I think that it's also important to kind of like just address the why, right? If you think about it, 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 it is there just first of all, it's it's a faster growing market uh, with membership growth, and we are in an environment where um, price increases, rate increases are not. Um, necessarily write a foregone conclusion for now it is, but maybe not next year, maybe not the year before. So you really have to think about where the membership growth opportunity. And then there's also the predictability in the stickiness of that member. I mean, the exchange market, if you look at it, right, there's 25% turnover. When you're in the risk taking business, 25% uh, turnover means that you really don't know 25% of your population every year and it's difficult to manage risk. And I, and I think that that's why why people really gravitate towards that MA marketplace. Yeah, the MA marketplace, I mean, not only is this very stable enrollment, but you could even invest in, uh, in people's health since they're gonna stay with your plan for many years. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what, what about, tech companies getting into the insurance industry in a sense are there real opportunities for them or is it really just to you know establish a foothold and then get bought by an insurer can the answer be tbd <laughs> be, like, to be determined um I, I right i think if you were to ask the tech companies they've got this shiny new bubble that is technology that they're going to apply to the insurance industry and do it different and if you talk to older line insurance companies, they would tell you that the blocking and tackling and dealing with the regulatory industry of the US insurance market is hard work and there's real value in the, in the long-term understanding and execution of those businesses. Um, right now, and, and I, I, kinda, I put it like this, I say, everybody's business in healthcare these days requires technology. You can't execute your business and operate your business without technology. 
that does not make every healthcare company a tech company. And, and yeah. That, yeah, understanding that bifurcation, I think, is important. And just the idea that you're going to, right? You 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 can be you you can be, just because you're a tech company doesn't come along. I mean, that you have the ability to like rewrite the the rules of how uh, the U.S. healthcare system works or the insurance system works. And again, Ricky made the point earlier, like this is a market that is inherently resistant to change and is inherently slow to change. Yeah, good point. So, you know, this could be an analog to the pharmaceutical industry where, you know, the development of new drugs, you know, shifted over time to, you know, biotech startups, but, you know, that didn't run into the, the rest of the pharma's business, which is, uh, you know, gaining regulatory approval and, and marketing uh, drugs. Uh, so I, I wonder if, if it's really a matter of uh, tech companies will come up and if they, you know, have a tool that uh, is very attractive to insurers, they will be bought. And then the next challenge will be, you know, how effectively can uh, an insurer integrate what they bought into their organization? Yeah, and, 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 and Paul, that, that analogy is right on. I mean, we actually um, use that same analogy in our 2022 outlook, where we said if, if, if you think about sort of biotechs, right, biotechs are innovators. They are coming up with, with the new drugs. Um, the large pharma companies are making them into products. Uh, that can be used in the in the marketplace. Um, so I think that that's an important differentiation, not just for the um, tech enabled MCOs, right? For all the other innovators uh, that we are seeing um, in the marketplace. I, I, I think where um, tech is gonna play an extremely important role is, is kind of like, how do you use the data? How, because manage, traditional managed care companies, you know, they have the data somewhere there, but they really haven't done anything with that data. Um, in that, and here you have companies that are very focused on that. So how do you stratify risk? How do you enable, because to me, without the tech, uh, how can we get really to value-based care and to risk-taking? So they have an enormous enormous role, uh, both on the back end, which a lot of healthcare is, is focused, but also on the front end, right? On the digital, on, on, on how do you engage members? Um, so I think their role is, 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 is critical. It's important. And we're starting to hear kind of like the, the large guys talking about it, right? These are sort of kind of like buzzwords that they're kind of like using. Um, and I think that ultimately they'll, they'll work together because there's really no other way to move this market forward. Yeah, I almost wonder if, if in a sense, maybe we shouldn't be looking that much at the tech companies appearing to try to enter the insurance business, but it may be an order of magnitude more as far as technology companies that are just, you know, selling their services as suppliers to the mainstream insurance companies. And that's maybe how new technology enters the insurance industry. Well, and to dovetail on what Ricky was saying, like, like it's using there's using the data and then like are you using it on the front end or the back end which has tremendous implications for outcomes and cost like are you using the data to keep people healthier to keep them out of the hospital to better engage with them and get them more involved with their health and thinking more about their health before they wind up having an acute care event as opposed to you know then there's using it on the back end after the acute care event uh for, for outcomes management for disease management um uh, kind of the just wanted to highlight the upstream and downstream implications of how you look at the data and how you use the data. Oh, good. No, thank you. And actually, have have insurers been making progress in using big data to uh, you know constructively intervene in the you know the delivery process for uh, the the patients they identify? Um, I can take that one. It's not really evident. And I think where we really need big data is on specialty drugs because specialty drugs are obviously a huge cost and there's no type of plan design or tier in specialty drugs because they don't have the data. And when I talk to consultants and when I ask them, they say employers just are not comfortable really tearing this, especially oncology drugs and things like that until they have the data. and. They've always said whatever PBM comes up with that first will be the, the key winner. And we just haven't seen it. So I, I obviously data is important, but I think when I, where I look at is what is the biggest cost right now, especially drugs, we don't have it for that specific thing. Other things we do, but that's the one thing that stands out to me that's missing when it comes to data. 
you know, to, to, to me, data is what we talked before about behavioral health, right? How do you take that behavioral health data, right? And how do you use that to understand uh, which patient is, is, is more or less likely to, um, to utilize the drugs or to be compliant with uh, certain, you know, um, treatments? Um, so, so again, I, I, I do think that it is going to be increasingly important. I do think that some of the, the tech startups, like for example, Alignment is, is starting to show some evidence, right? And how kind of like the data that they have is starting to have an impact on MLR. Um, still early days, but we're starting to see some sort of um, hints of, of, of uh, proof points. My, my, my last point that I add is so much of healthcare data is unstructured data. Mm -hmm. How do you yeah. use it? How do you like how do you how do you how do you how do you take the unstructured data and turn it into something that's quantifiable and structurable and that you can employ into care delivery? It's just it's hard. It's very hard. Yeah, I guess that's why it's been slow to uh, to make that useful. Uh, let's let's change uh, topics again. Social determinants of health and equity. And are insurers or large self-insured employers taking concrete steps to address social determinants of health and racial and ethnic disparities in access to care? So, you know, um, this is probably the, the biggest, right? And, and, and more good, social determinants of healthcare and, and health and equity with behavioral health, I think are really kind of like the two big, biggest issues that, that have emerged out of the pandemic. Um, I think interestingly, there was a question before about sort of those primary care model and innovators. We're seeing some of these primary care value-based um, models that are concentrated, right, around kind of like areas with certain populations where um, they help, right, kind of like close these gaps in cares and in 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 in, in um, help um, population that in the past have been marginalized. Um, to, to get the care that they need. Um, we are also starting to see some plans, and again, these are more sort of the startups that are um, looking at uh, plan design, right? And different um, plans that are more focused on ethnic groups because there are different needs. So very early days, but um, we're starting to see more of it. And, and I think that again, when we think about what are the long, Longer term trends post pandemic, I think that's a very important one. Great. Okay. Uh, Medicaid managed care. Uh, you know, how are the various state demonstrations that have relied on private plans to serve beneficiaries dually eligible for Medicare and Medicaid working out? Uh, has anyone, you know, been, been following that? I was like, I have not followed it as closely as I should. I know it is a, it's a very high pressure point because they are your hardest to treat, yeah. and most expensive, and kind of least that's that's your hardest to treat, most expensive and least responsive patient population. Um, so, and 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 like like I, I feel like as long as I've been looking at managed care, the idea of getting to the duels has been a challenge. I, I kind of like what Anne said on the PBS. I don't think anybody's cracked the code yet given the, the nature of what the dual eligible population looks like. But yeah. Yeah, and, and, and clearly, you know, it, it's a large opportunity. I think what, there are like 12 million jewels, maybe 3 million are, are, are managed. <laughs> opportunities there. But, but, but one thing that we have to remember when we're asking are there proof points is what the MMP program started in 2013. Um, it takes time for these things to keep momentum and then COVID happened. And it, that kind of like put a stop to everything. And, and, and so I, I do think that that has put us, we're now at the third year, that has put us at least two to three years uh, behind in really kind of like understanding what's the impact and, and, and moving forward. And I think that's true, not just for this, but for a lot of other demo programs, um, a lot of other uh, projects that, whether it's CMI, says CMS, CMI, um, have been kind of like um, looking at. Good, thank you. Uh, question about PBMs. Uh, you know, it seems though, you know, over a bunch of years, most of the major PBMs have been acquired by insurers. Any perspectives on how the vertical integration between PBMs and insurers has has progressed? Has, has this turned out to be valuable or, or not? 
can take a shot. I, th I think it actually depends on the company. Like, for example, CVS was the first one to do it, I mean, over 10 years ago. And I do believe that they've gained market share because of their vertical integration into the PPM and now the health insurance. Because if you look at Walgreens, you look at CVS, um, you take out all the COVID noise, Walgreens scripts are flat-ish, where CVS is still growing mid single digits. And that, that to me is evidence of their, their strategy to acquire payers and move market share and shift them to the retail setting. So I would say for CVS, definitely yes. Um, I'm less skeptical right now of Signer and UNH. I mean, it's not, it doesn't hurt them, but has it benefited them like they have for CVS? Um, I would, I would argue not as much. So I would say, you know, CVS has been at it the longest, right? They've, they've kind of like owned Caremark for a very long time. Um, the others, you know, this is, is more recent. But if you really think about where it makes sense, where it adds value, it adds value and makes sense in specialty. Yeah. Uh, specialty management, right? That 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 is where the cost is, is, is on the medical side. And I think that if you talk, think about what kind of like um, United talked about in their earnest day, right? They want to be in the PBM side in Alpha MRX in the area of, of where they add value. Uh, not where they act as a claim processor or transactional. Yeah. Um, and that's where the tie with the insurance is. And I think that we're actually going to start to see more impact to the bottom line in 23 and 24, because that's when we're going to see, uh, you know, the Umera biosimilar introduction, we're going to see a bioequivalent. Um, and all of a sudden these, because these, PBMs, aside from just being a PBM, they do, they have another function, right? Especially pharmacies. Um, and I think that um, probably 12 to 18 months from now is going to be the first time we're actually going to see um, meaningful impact to operating income to growth rates. And then longer term, it's, it's how well are you integrating really kind of like the managing the medical with managing the specialty how do you use big data to do it? How do you use technology, right? It all comes together. Yeah, you know, since only the largest insurers are integrated with PBMs now, uh, you know, what are the implications for the other insurers? Is this going to, in a sense, uh, put them at a significant disadvantage and kind of lead to further consolidation in the insurance market? I guess I'd hop in here and I'd say like, I think if PBM, like most people, I think if you spoke to most people who aren't on this call and aren't listening, they wouldn't know who their PBM is or what a PBM does. Um, and PBM generally is a business that operates in the back office of healthcare. Uh, and it's a business that benefits from obfuscation. It's, a, it's kind of a, a business that benefits from, from being in the dark. Um, I think that you're seeing, you've seen Anthem effectively build its own PBM. Um, Centene has been public about wanting to, you know, rework to some degree its PBM partnership, whether it stays with CVS or whether it picks a new partner. Um, I guess what I've been looking at most recently as it relates to PBM is there were a lot of state legislative initiatives that could have negative regulatory impacts on the PBMs. You're not necessarily seeing anything at the federal level, but there are about 15 to 25 states that want to drive increasing transparency into the PBM space, change the pricing models, change the reimbursement models, turn some of the PBMs into a fiduciary. Um, so I guess I think I think that PBM historically is a business that has benefited from scale. And you've seen consolidation into three large PBMs, which have found homes inside of three large insurance companies. And the only way it seems to dislodge that scale or reverse that scale. And I kind of say this from the perspective of like kind of right, whenever the mark, whenever normally functioning markets seem to get out of balance a little bit. Sometimes there's a regulatory course correct, and are we seeing a, you know the, the beginnings of a regulatory course correct at the state level? Um, that that's so. I think it's been a, I think it's been a benefit to the MCOs. I think it's been a benefit to the PBMs. I think I think there are, there are industries that are concerned that there needs to be a course correction that has to occur at the regulatory level, particularly at the state level. Particularly, I'm talking about the you know state boards of pharmacy and state pharmacy lobbies that are trying to push this. Um, that I, I guess, you know, while I think there's been a big opportunity and big benefit to the MCOs, uh, I worry that competitive balance may, may have gotten a little bit out of whack 
and and you know what now what I, I'm seeing I'm seeing risk in that market as opposed to seeing tremendous opportunity in that market. I see. Thank you. Our time is running running out. Let me just get to a question from the audience uh, as we as we finish up. Given the evidence emerging about interference from outside investors in clinical decision making in primary care and other physician practices or, or hospitals, do you anticipate greater regulation affecting the role of management services organizations or related structures? I don't know that I agree with the premise, Paul. Okay. Yeah. Okay, that, that, that should be the take home for the audience. Yeah, uh, yeah I think we're, you know, l- let me wrap this up now because I want to thank you because I think each of you have done a magnificent job today uh, in contributing to this discussion. I think it's been really rich. I hope our audience feels that way uh, too. I want to thank Arnold Ventures again for providing support for this uh, this event and uh and, uh, and thank the audience for uh, uh, staying so long. Uh, so I guess we'll, we'll end it right now. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.